Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today I'm going to do part nine on a study of the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> if you haven't seen the first nine chapters, uh, uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so you can go back there to see those. Uh, I'm going to pick up right now with ch chapter nine, verse one. We'll just go through it a verse at a time and see what we can uh, glean from this. Um, first, I'm going to read this from the uh, KJV, and then I may look at it in the Amplified if necessary. It says, Proverbs 9, verse 1, Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Hmm. Well, uh, numerous times now, uh, I've discussed the the uh, concept that uh, in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified. Uh, it uh, refers to wisdom as she. So that's the first thing we have to understand. Uh, but the rest of this, there's an awful lot of symbolism in there. And I don't claim to understand what all the symbolism means. I'm not going to comment generally, but let me see if I can get a clue from the uh, uh, Amplified Version, see how it, that describes it. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out and set up her seven uh, pillars. It says seven, the perfect number of pillars. <clears throat> so seven, because that's the number of perfection, I guess. She has killed her beasts. She has mixed her spiritual wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maids to cry from the highest places of the town. So it, it seems to me that uh, God wants us to be wise and wisdom is personified as this woman and it says that she uh, is doing these things because she wants us to accept wisdom. And uh, I guess the, the first thing, wise thing we can do is understand the, the value of wisdom. Uh, when we get wisdom, then uh, many other fringe benefits come along with it, such as maybe good health, good relationships, friendships, uh, good conduct, uh, prosperity. A lot of these things uh, are results of being wise. And uh, wisdom, as we said earlier, is, talks about wisdom and understanding, or wisdom and knowledge. But we can gain knowledge, we can gain understanding, but it's only wisdom when we apply these things to our lives. So wisdom is, is uh, knowledge applied. Uh, so we're seeing here in the beginning of this that it uh, seems that God wants us, uh, is, is calling out and saying, wisdom wants you to embrace wisdom. Now let's look at, uh, go back to the KJV, and it says in verse 4, Whoso is simple, let him turn hither, as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which is mingled, which I mingled. Yeah, a lot of symbolism in these verses too. Uh, whosoever, whoso is simple, uh, that means that uh, you don't have wisdom. You you are a simple ton in the, in the sense that you don't have a lot of knowledge and understanding, and you certainly don't have wisdom. Uh, let him, let him turn hither. If you're if you're simple, if you don't have knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, 
then you can turn towards wisdom and 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 uh, desire it. And if you desire it and pursue it, you can gain wisdom. Uh, it says, "Ask for him that wanteth understanding." So if you are simple, you do not have understanding, you do not have wisdom, and you desire it, you can turn towards it. It says, "She saith to him, Come, eat of my bread." and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Of course, as a Christian, a person who uh, relies on Jesus Christ for my salvation, I can see some great symbolism here in verse five. It says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Uh, of course, bread and wine is symbolic of salvation. Jesus said that to, to, to eat, uh, he's the bread of life. Uh, uh, and to drink, drink his, his blood, his uh, eat, salvation is as easy as eating and drinking. Uh, so this, I see a lot of symbolism for salvation here, but I, I don't think the subject of this chapter, this part of Proverbs is salvation at all, but we can certainly see uh, a lot of times we can see salvation throughout the scriptures, even though when that's not the primary subject. So it says, um, let's look at this in uh, the Amplified. Uh, it says in verse 4 and 5, Whoever is simple, that means easily led astray and wavering, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, God's wisdom says to him, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the spiritual wine which I have mixed. So in the Amplified Version, it, it, uh, it says that this is uh, spiritual. And uh, I think that a lot of the things I've read so far here are spiritual and and uh, symbolic. Uh, certainly not to take in all of this uh, literally, but uh, there's symbolic spiritual meaning behind it. Uh, now I'm going to go to verse 6. Forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. Forsake the foolish and live. Again, throughout Proverbs, uh, King Solomon talks a lot about uh, uh, following the commandments, uh, being wise, un having understanding and wisdom. And by doing these things, you will live a longer life, you'll be healthier, you'll be blessed. And that was always the purpose of uh, the commandments of uh, that uh, Moses received, not only the ten, but the entire six hundred thirteen. Uh, the commandments were never intended for us as a uh, means of attaining salvation. If we are able to follow the commandments well enough, we can be have eternal life in heaven. If that's what you think, then you're just the most serious error of all. Uh, the, the commandments given to the Israelites uh, through Moses, first of all, they were never given to the rest of the world, to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. The, the commandments were never given to me. Unless you're a, a Jewish person following Judaism, then it, you shouldn't even think of these commandments as applying to you. They were given to the Jewish people, and the purpose was not for salvation. The purpose was for prosperity, good health, long lives. And uh, that's what it says here in verse six. It says, forsake the foolish and live. So when you do foolish things, and so far we talked about a lot of foolish things in these first eight chapters, uh, the foolishness of hanging around with bad people and getting into trouble, uh, the, the foolishness of uh, allowing yourself to be seduced by a strange woman and get into fornication or adultery. Uh, and so 
these themes are recurring, uh, but uh, the, the, the contrast in Proverbs is basically two things, foolishness or wisdom. Uh, when we're foolish, bad, we get bad results in our life. When we're wise, we get good results in our life. So it says, forsake the foolish and live. In other words, if you are foolish, don't expect to live. Uh, well, it doesn't mean you're going to you know, die that moment, but, but over a period, your life will be shortened if you are a foolish person. And I can, I know people in my life that I've loved very much and cared about, and uh, they've, they've had uh, foolish lifestyles, either alcoholism and uh, shortened their life, or um, drug abuse shortened their life, or overeating shortened their life. Uh, and, and all these things are, are, uh, could be on a list of foolish things, foolish ways to live. And so, it says, forsake the foolish and live. Uh, now let's look at verse 7. It says, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Whoa. That might be a shocking statement for, for many of us. Oh, think about that. Let me read it again in KJV, and then we'll try to understand it better with the Amplified. It says, he that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. Did you think that we're supposed to be reproving the scorners? According to this, we're not supposed to be reproving it. It's, uh, we're, it's a shameful thing to do, is to reprove a scorner. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Oh, wow. I wonder how many of you out there think that it is the correct to rebuke a wicked man. But it says here, no. If you rebuke a wicked man, you getteth a blot for yourself. Okay. Uh, let's look at 7 in the Amplified. That's kind of a shocking verse for me so far. Um, uh, I've, I've always uh, thought that, uh, well, we should reprove them and, but then, and then move on. Don't waste a lot of time going over and over trying to correct someone. Uh, you can correct them, but then uh, after if they're not listening, then it's like casting your pearls to the swine. We need to just dust up our feet and move on. But according to verse 7, uh, it says don't reprove them at all. So let's look at the Amplified. He who, rebu he who rebukes a scorner heaps upon himself abuse. And he, he, he who reproves a wicked man gets for himself bruises. <laughs> Sounds to me like it's telling us we should kind of mind our own business. If you enter that arena, if you know someone who is a scorner, someone who is like, just like a bad person that, uh, that is, is behaving badly and, and uh, saying bad things, and, and uh, that you, if you rebuke them, then you're asking for trouble. You're going to get for yourself some abuse coming back. And he, he who reproves a wicked man gets for himself bruises. So if you see that someone is wicked, maybe they're a criminal, maybe they're violent, maybe they're a drunk, drunkard and violent, and, and you go up and you try to uh, reprove him, that means to tell him he's wrong and correct him and tell him to change, uh, then you're going to get bruises. I mean, don't expect the wicked man to listen to you. He's probably going to get violent and do some violent act on you. So it says in verse 8, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Wow, that is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. Uh, so if you 
are aware that someone is wicked. I guess it's best just to avoid them. Don't even confront them with it. Just avoid them. Uh, but if you know that someone is wise, and, and uh, but they're, they're, they uh, need to be reproved or corrected in something, then you can feel good about approaching a wise person because a wise person is not going to react violently with anger and violence against you because you come to him to correct him. A wise person will love you because you care enough to make an effort to correct him. Uh, it's, it's been my uh, philosophy for many years now that uh, I, I want to talk to people who disagree with me. Uh, I mean, I, I like it when people agree, but on the other hand, it, it can be boring because uh, there, there's a saying that if two men always agree, one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, how can you learn from if, if someone is just repeating your own words back to you all the time? But if you talk to someone who disagrees with you, you're going to learn something. You might learn that they're seriously wrong, or you might learn that you're seriously wrong. But if we're wise, we want to hear other opinions. We want to listen to the person who says, hey, Brother Luke, I think you're wrong about this, and this is why. Well, if I was a wicked man or a fool, I would react with anger and violence. But if I'm wise, I would say, thank you. I want to, I want to hear your opinion on this. And I, I found that uh, by listening to people who have different opinions on theology, it's been very helpful to me. There have been some times where they actually persuaded me and I changed my mind. Uh, there are times where they tried to persuade me, but they, they failed. And maybe I was able to persuade them that they are wrong and they agreed with me. Sometimes, though, no one is persuaded. But it's not a loss because both sides at least gained some knowledge and understanding. So let's look at this verses uh, uh, seven and eight in the Amplified. Oh, I did look at that in the Amplified already. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Now let's look at uh, 9 in the KJV. Give instructions to a wise man, and he will, let, it will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Well, verse 9 is the, I guess, the, the end of that thought. You know, you, you uh, it's, it's helpful in studying the scriptures to realize that um, verse numbers and chapters, divisions, are not necessarily uh, done because it's, it's, that's the dividing point for a particular lesson or a thought. Sometimes the thought, uh, the, the, the whole point ends uh, in the middle of a chapter and the new thought, new, new lesson has, begins. And it looks to me like, uh, maybe I have jump to a conclusion, but it looks to me that verse nine is the end of this thought here. Uh, give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a man, a just man, and he will increase in learning. Let's look at that in the Amplified. Give instructions to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a righteous man, one upright and in right standing with God, and he will increase in learning. Exactly the point I was making. Uh, we should not be afraid of uh, correction. 
Um, but I hope that we're also uh, smart enough, wise enough, discern well enough to recognize that if someone is not a wise person, we don't go and try to correct them. If they're a fool or a wicked person, it's best just to avoid them. Because if you try to correct them, as it says in the prior verses, you're going to get just get shame and, and bruises. So let's be wise in dis discernment and recognize who has ears to hear and who, who doesn't. And if, if you know that someone is wise and they're going to be willing to listen to you, then you should go to them and pr present your ideas. And if you think they need to be corrected, then, then do it. And if they are wise, they're going to embrace what you say, consider it, maybe change their mind if, if it turns out that they agree that uh, you are correct, or maybe they won't agree with you. But at least they're not going to give you bruises. You're not going to feel shame because you know you were just like cast away as a fool for trying to trying to instruct a uh, you know a wicked person. So now let's go to verse uh, uh, verse ten and eleven. It says, "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom." It's this is a phrase that, that we've seen several times before in Proverbs. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. So this is the, the, the same point that I made in the beginning, is that the purpose of having wisdom and knowledge and following God's key commands is as it states right here again. For by me thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. So you live longer if you gain wisdom. Now, verse 12, if thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou scornest, Thou alone shalt bear it. Hmm. Let me read 11 and 12. Actually, 10, 11, and 12. I'm going to look at it being amplified. The reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is the beginning. That's the chief and choice part of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight and understanding. Well, the Amplified Version takes the scripture and amplifies. And I'm, I'm amplifying as I'm discussing these scriptures. I'm reading the scriptures and amplifying my thoughts on it. And, uh, of course, my words are not scripture. But I'm, I'm giving you my thoughts and my, uh, I'm expounding or amplifying my thoughts. Uh, hopefully that you'll get some, gain some insights. Uh, but as I look at the amplified version, the author or committee who wrote the amplified version is doing the same thing. They they show you the scriptures and then they expound upon it a little bit to help us understand. So I like how this is stated here. Verse ten it says the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, you see, if it says simply the fear of the Lord, uh, people can get the wrong impression about God, that he's some vengeful, cruel, uh, you know, tyrant. And it, you know, all he wants to do is punish people and, you know, uh, you know burn them in hell. And just, it, 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 that's, that's not the, the God uh, of the Bible. The God of the Bible is love, mercy, grace. Um, um, so when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, many people uh, don't understand the fear. What does the fear mean? We've talked about this before, and it really means respect or reverence for God. 
and that's how the amplified here is treating it. It says, in verse 10, the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord. So it's not that the fear of the Lord, the thinking he's some tyrant, some cruel, sadistic, you know, a, a sadist. Um, no, it's it's we revere him, we worship him, and and that's the kind of fear. If if the word fear is to be used, it's that kind of fear of the Lord. Is the beginning of says the chief and choice part of wisdom. Okay, so that the first part of wisdom is is respecting worship and respect God and this is and the knowledge of the holy one the knowledge of God understanding God pursuing God studying the scriptures prayer having this relationship and building a relationship with God is insight and understanding Okay, now let's look at verses uh, 11 in the KJV. It says, For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Again, uh, I can't say this enough, because this is one of the biggest errors in Christendom. Uh, people are taught that... Uh, Salvation comes by your faithful and diligent uh, ability to follow commandments and be religious. But nowhere in the scriptures does it say that. All through the Old Testament, and that's where we are now, the book of Proverbs, the Old Testament, written by King Solomon. And he's talking about wisdom, and sometimes he refers to commandments. It, it, every time it's telling us to do these things it's saying what you get in return it's not salvation it's for by me that's wisdom thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased so if, if you're one of these people that you know thinks that uh you know salvation is attained by being religious, you know, following commandments, living your life in a wise way, um, that somehow that is going to, through that, you will attain salvation. That's, that's not scripture. That's not biblical Christianity at all. And you will fail. You cannot get salvation through your own efforts. Salvation comes only through Jesus Christ and believing in him for salvation, believing that he is God Almighty and he paid for our sins on the cross and he raised himself from the dead, showing he does have power or life and death and putting our life and our future in his hands and trusting him, believing his promise that we get eternal life through faith in him. So salvation has nothing to do with our own ability to perform salvation is believing in what Jesus did, who He is, and His His promises. Let me look at uh, this in the Amplified. Uh, it says in verse eleven, "For by me, that's wisdom from God, your days shall be multiplied, and the years of your life shall be increased." And then let's go to verse 12 in the KJV. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. And in the Amplified, it explains it. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scorn, you are alone. You will bear it and pay the penalty. Jesus and Paul both mentioned the, the, the law of reaping and sowing. And I think this is an example of what they were talking about. That, uh, you know, uh, if you're wise, you, you're going to be doing good things. You will be uh, sowing 
you're sowing good things in your life. That's wisdom. And what you reap for it is a long life and prosperity and good health and all these good things. We reap what we sow. And that's what that's telling us here. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. It's going to benefit you. If you scorn, you alone will bear it. If you scorn, if you're unwise, you're evil, you know, you're going to bear the consequences. This is and pay the penalty. Look at that in the amplified. That was the amplified. Okay. Now let's go to verse 13 in the KJV. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. A foolish woman, huh? For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. This is, uh, as I've said uh, over and over again, there are certain things that Solomon is warning us about over and over and over again. The strange woman that seduces you into sin, uh, the, the bad friends that seduce you into crime or violence, um, laziness, Produce, you know, you, you, your life will not make progress if you're lazy. Your uh, uh, gluttony, if you're glutton, then you will get bad health. If you drink too much, you're going to become a drunkard and unproductive and lose your health and everything. Over and over again, these things are repeated because Solomon wants us to understand that certain kind of behavior, certain decisions we make in our lives, are, are lead to destruction. Not destruction, I'm talking about hell, but a destroy, destroyed life. And so now, again, he's talking about this strange woman. And here he calls a foolish woman. A foolish woman is clamorous. So let, let's, let's look at the amplified version and see how it describes this woman. The foolish woman is noisy. She is simple and open to all forms of evil. She willfully and recklessly knows nothing whatever of eternal value. For she sits at the door of her house or on a seat in the conspicuous places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who go uprightly on their way. So this woman is attempting to attract a man, seduce a man into sin. And if you allow yourself to be seduced by her and have an encounter with her, a relationship with her, uh, the result will be temporary pleasure, but, but maybe a lifetime of destruction. Because maybe that encounter with this woman will lead to a divorce. And uh, uh, your wife leaves you. She takes the children. Now you have no wife, no relationship with your children. She, take, she In divorce court, she takes your property. And then maybe you get depressed and you start drinking and your life gets destroyed through alcoholism. Maybe you got a sexually transmitted disease from this woman and you get ill physically, maybe or take, that disease takes your life. There's, there's all kinds of consequences, bad consequences that come from these things. So we're born over and over and again by Solomon. This is foolishness. He's contrasting foolish living versus wise living. 
and it gives a, a list of foolish things and a list, list of wise things that we should incorporate into our lives. Um, verse 16, whoever is simple, that's wavering and easily led astray, let him turn in here. So if you're simple-minded and you don't have wisdom and you don't understand the pitfalls of this, go ahead and go ahead and turn and be, be seduced by this woman. And as for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, this is her attempt to seduce him further. Stolen waters, as pleasures are sweet. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that said uh, other, in other ways too. Uh, there's a uh, why, why people uh, that they want to do something that's forbidden because if it's uh, if it's forbidden, it's like the forbidden fruit. It seduces us. We want to know what it's like because it's forbidden. Well, uh, it's it's forbidden because God knows that it's going to destroy you. So we're told, avoid these things. But it's not forbidden in it. There's a, it's put into a vault and locked up and you don't have access to it. No, temptations are there. You're going to encounter these people. The scornful man, the evil man. You avoid them, don't try to corrupt them. The, the foolish woman that, sed that seduces you and tells you, oh, this is forbidden fruit. It's even sweeter. Have a relationship with me. Oh, I see the ring on your hand. Don't worry about that. Your wife will never find out. Stolen waters are sweet because they are forbidden. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Verse 18. But he knows not that the shades of the dead are there. Spectres haunting the scene of past transgressions. So this woman is uh, not only living a life that is destructive for her, but she's her, she's uh, attracting people into her life and destroying their lives too. And there's a past. It says, but he knows not that the shades of the dead are there. You know the, her previous conquests of men and ruined lives. It says the specters haunting the scene of past transgressions. You think you're the first woman this? Uh, you're the first person this woman has seduced? No, there's there's a history there, and, and that her invited kiss are already sunk in the depths of Sheol, the lower world, Hades, the place of the dead. Okay, so. That is chapter nine of Proverbs. So uh, every Wednesday, uh, I'll do another chapter. <coughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, every Wednesday, I uh, will get wiser. That's why I call the series Wisdom Wednesdays. Uh, it's, it's been said numerous times now in this study that uh, there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. And many people have taken on the as a routine to privately just read, pray, and meditate on each, a chapter a day. They're not very long. You can read a chapter a day in a few minutes. And by reading it over and over and over again, and then you finish 31 chapters, and then you begin and start it all over again. And making this a practice in your life that these good values, this wisdom, will be, become part of the way you think and you'll be transformed. As it says here, in this, it's just brainwashed. And it's talking about the scripture says they were transformed by the ruined, renewing of their mind by the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, read the Proverbs over and over and over again, and it will transform you. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, living in you, then much of this you probably won't even understand. The scriptures tell us you can't understand the scriptures uh, right correctly unless you have the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? 
Are you a child of God? This is one of the big lies in the world that most people think that everyone is a child of God. But the scriptures tell us no. We only become a child of God when we are born again. See, our first birth from our mother's womb was a physical birth. Uh, and we have a physical body. We have a soul, which is our mind, our consciousness, our understanding. But we have a spirit. But the spirit that we're born with is dead, the scripture says, because Adam and Eve fell, their spirits died, and every one of us who are descendants of Adam and Eve were born with this dead spirit. Uh, so if, if, if you want your spirit brought to life, that's what Jesus was talking about being born again. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't go to heaven unless you're born again, spiritually from above. You need the Holy Spirit of God to come in and bring your spirit to life and unite with your spirit. So your spirit's here dead. The Holy Spirit comes here, connects and regenerates, quickens, brings your spirit to life. Now the Holy Spirit's connected to you. That's called baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes and connects to you, regenerates you. And then the scripture says that we are indwelled. The Holy Spirit continues living in us. The scriptures also say that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed means uh, it's, it's there in a way that it's put in a vault and locked up and it, it can never be gone. You can never lose the Holy Spirit. Uh, so when this happens, the, the scripture says you become a child of God at that point. So uh, if you want to understand Proverbs, and it, you know, you need to have the Holy Spirit in you. Uh, it, 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 but more importantly than that is if you want to have eternal life, see, the Bible says it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Every one of us is going to die once and then we're going to get judged. And the judgment is simply, did you receive eternal life from Jesus or did you reject that? And if you rejected it, you don't have eternal life. Therefore, you have death. You go into the lake of fire. That's called the second death. But if you believe in Jesus, you receive this Holy Spirit, this new birth, you're a child of God, then you go to the, the judgment, and the judgment is you have life. You received life from Jesus. You're saved from the second death. You don't have to suffer the second death. So, more important than, than wisdom and everything else that we're talking about in these studies, I would say that before you get all the wisdom that we've been describing here, the first wisdom you need is that what uh, Paul said to Timothy, uh, that the wisdom unto salvation. You want salvation? You want eternal life? You want to be a child of God? You want to live forever in heaven? Then the wisdom unto salvation is understanding that you need Jesus. Understanding that you cannot get to heaven through personal merit by working your way there or by uh, striving, following commandments, trying to be a good person, trying to be religious and thinking that if I'm just good enough, God will accept me. You can't do it because the Bible says we all fall short. No matter how hard we strive, we will fall short. We can't reach heaven that way. So just admit defeat. Say, I'm defeated. I surrender. I can't do it. I need Jesus. And that's why Jesus came. The Bible says that Jesus came down from heaven. It says he's God. He came down from heaven. And he said the reason he did it is he wanted to become a man so that he could die for our sins. And that's what he did. He died on a cross and he paid for our sins. Now, sin's not an issue. Sin's not a barrier. You can have a relationship with God because Jesus paid for your sins. And he raised himself from the dead on the third day. He did that so he could prove to us 
He is God. He does have power over life and death. And he promises, if you trust him completely, stop trying to work your way to heaven and instead trust him, then he will give you eternal life as a free gift. And he raised himself from the dead to prove that he is worthy of our faith. You can trust him. You can put your confidence in him. If you do that, you get born again, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and you never have to worry because the scripture, Jesus says he has you in the palm of his hand, and he will never let you go. He will never leave you or forsake you. No matter what you do in your life after that point, he has you and you belong to him, and he's going to take you to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? That's why it's called the gospel. That's just a Greek word. It just means good news. Uh, I think it should be translated as the great news, the best news. All right. That ends the study for today. I uh, hope you join me again next Wednesday for Chapter 10 of Proverbs. Uh, I look forward to your comments. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.